Hello and welcome. I'm Sharon Ross with the Capital City Arts Initiative. CCI's graphic designer, Crystal Passink, is here with us as well. We're delighted to host this online Nevada Neighbors Artist Studio presentation. It's part of an ongoing series of talks about contemporary visual art practices. We're delighted to present Phyllis Schaefer's interview with Paula Chung to discuss Paula's work in her current exhibition, Impact in the Carson City Courthouse Gallery. Phyllis and Paula, welcome. Hi. Hi, thank you for having us. Um, I guess I'll start out, Paula. Um, my name is Phyllis Schaefer, and um, thank you to CCAI for this uh, invite. And um, I'm so enjoying the, the opportunity to talk with Paula Chung, who's been a dear friend for many years now. Um, I am a, an artist living in the Tahoe Basin, and I've taught for 25 years as a full-time faculty member at Lake Tahoe Community College. And that's where I met Paula Chung first. Um, I think we formally met um, at Lake Tahoe Community College in the art department in around um, 2007, when Paula signed up for a drawing class of mine. And she had already been taking sculpture courses in the department. So I sort of knew of her obliquely, but that was when we first came in contact with each other. Um, since that time, Paula has taken several painting and drawing courses from me. Um, and my relationship with Paula is uh, multifaceted. I uh, started out as teacher student and I very quickly realized once I began to become aware of her um, flower series, her fiber pieces on um, flowers, that this was a, a serious, very accomplished and very serious artist in her own right, who was just taking classes in another medium from me. And um, so I think from the very beginning, there was a great deal of respect and um, regard for her as an artist in her own right. And it was really fun to watch her take on a new medium. Uh, so we had that relationship as student teacher, uh, but also as fellow artist. And then um, almost immediately our friendship began to, to grow. And, and I would say that I count on her as um, one of my best friends at this point. So um, Paula, tell us a little bit uh, about your experience of um, coming to Lake Tahoe Community College and taking courses. Well, I, I had never had any art training and I felt I needed, I needed to learn about everything. I was really a blank canvas. Everything was just um, hit and miss. And if I could, I was experimenting a lot with fiber, but um, I didn't know where I was going and I didn't have any direction. And I had no skills as a, as a painter or I didn't even know I could paint or draw. So that was um, really beneficial to me. And um, the sculpture part really helped me to see things differently that I could um, visualize 3D where I had never really thought about it. And um, I had always had an interest in color, but no training and, and through the painting, I found myself seeing color everywhere. And that was um, amazing to me that to see the world totally different than um, just the normal bystander. And mm -hmm. so that was real uh, helpful, powerful. I, I think I really noticed right away that Paula used a pencil and a brush in a very unique kind of way. And I think it really does go right back to your activity sewing. And we've talked about this, how the needle is your pencil or your, or your paint brush, because there is a, a yeah. way that you make a mark that really I think translates across to your fiber work. Yeah, I think with the um, embroidery, and I think that's why I wanted to get into printmaking some, is that it's all about line. And um, 
how line is so important and um, being able to make multiple lines and creating texture and it's just a whole a whole gamut of wonderful experiences. So when I first met you, um, I saw the flower series. Can you tell us a little bit about um, where that began, what it meant for you? And then I want to talk about how it kind of shifts away from the flower series into the next series, the MRI human body forms. But let's start with the, the flower series. Well, it started actually through sculpture. Um, I was examining a tulip and, and saw that the little stamens kind of looked like people. And so I started sculpting family members and groups. And um, from there, I thought, well, I could translate this into fiber. And so I started working with silk and dyeing, hand dyeing silk and um, I would photograph a flower and then blow it up and then um, mark out all the colors and that would um, then give me a, a, a pattern to put these areas together and uh, in an applique version. So uh, it was stitching each piece together and that created um, the each segment created these flowers that I was able to um, then present as my type of art at that time. Your process began as more of a traditional quilter, didn't it? Yeah, back in the 70s, I started doing um, piecework and um, then totally left it and didn't get back into it until uh, early 2000 uh -huh. and actually my first art quilt that I considered was uh, the 9-11 um, tragedy so I had never tried to, to make art with fiber before so that was kind of an interesting jump yeah I guess I do find um what's really unusual is your jump from a traditional um, quilting uh, genre and all of this do on your own. I mean, when you started doing the blown up flower pieces, you're stepping out into some new territory. Did you feel it? Did you, um, did you feel like you were leaving one group and joining another or did you never feel like you were in a group to begin with? Well, I never, I never like to look back and I don't, I never really felt part of a group. Um, it just, what I could do and, per, and push myself to do more and learn more. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think that's probably what brought you to Lake Tahoe Community College um, to take, take up um, sculpture and drawing and painting. Uh, I really admire that. Um, that constant yearning for more information. Yeah. So, um, yes, go ahead. Younger. <laughs> <laughs> so then the flower pieces, which were just lovely. And I think um, all of us here probably first came to know you because of that series. Um, and then you transition into the MRI human body um, pieces. Tell us a little bit about that transition. What made it happen? What was the first uh, foray into that? Well, I it actually was in painting and I, um, I kind of got to a point where I didn't want to make a beautiful painting anymore. You know, <laughs> I, I just wanted to have something that had meaning. And a friend of mine, um, had her MRI on the table and I saw it and I just was so taken by it. It was so beautiful. And that's what prompted me to look into the, the inner body and the imagery that you see in a body that most people take for granted. So that, that it, um, meant that you had to come up with a source for all of this imagery, where did you um, where did you first start to look for um, these images? 
Well, my first source was my friend, and she uh -huh. gave every uh, every image that she had ever done. And then I started looking on the internet, and it was then friends started offering me their images, and um, it was so helpful to me to um, use friends' imagery because it meant a lot more to me than. Um, than just a, an anonymous person that you didn't know. So, so these were MRIs um, that had been taken because someone had some kind of trauma or disability or something that, uh, or surgery, surgery, that kind of thing. How did that play into the content of the work? Um, I think I, I wasn't really looking at that so much as, as just the beauty of the in, inner body. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, this actually was the image, the, one of the first images that I had ever um, seen. And that was my friend. And um, I just thought, what a beautiful image that was. And um, then as it got, it got to be kind of, harder in some things and um then we um i was using sonograms of um the babies and that that became more hopeful and um so it wasn't um it wasn't so difficult to just continue to stitch yeah, I, I see what you mean, because when I look at these, there's a certain kind of mapping that I see as a visual continuity from the flowers to the MRI to even the, the geography series that you're working on and, and, and beyond. Um, everything that you've done, there's this, um, there's something about mapping is the best word I can come up with and a way of dissecting um, the minutiae of how things look and then reconstructing them into a new, a new way, I guess. Does that sound, does that yeah. sound? You said it, said it a lot better than I would ever be able to. <laughs> but I think that um, the MRIs did then continue to become more about a kind of social commentary and, and very poignant. Um, can you talk a little bit about how they evolved? Um, well, are you, are you talking about the newer series? I, yeah. I started, I started looking at um, violence on the body and uh -huh. um, that's what prompted me to do the um, CTE scans of, um, football players' brains and uh, PTSD. And um, so uh, it kind of led from, from a beautiful imagery to things that were going on, um, impacting other people. And that's how that, that title of, came about was um, just how uh, people have been enduring uh, some some things to themselves, to their bodies. Uh huh. And I, I'm not saying well, but I think I think it's also. I mean, there's so many layers going on when one looks at your pieces. First of all, there's just this excruciating beauty, um, and then the the sensitivity, like the, the series where you were um, stitching on the recycled um, tea bags. You know, there, I think there's um, yeah. just so many layers. And then there's just this luscious, lovely um, craft and this um, sensitivity to color. So um, I, think, I think there's a lot of layers going on all the time. And maybe, um, maybe tell us a little bit about the craft, um, just because you worked so many hours to create these things. Um, I think that 
one of the things I first recognized was that um, you get an impact of your work because of its scale from a distance. Yes. And then when you move in closely, you get this just lusciousness of the surface and the color. And can you talk a little bit about the craft and what your process is in bringing these things about? Well, at first I was using um, silk and using that for the flowers and hand dyeing it and um, trying to uh, come as close to the color that I, that I see, that I saw in the image. Mm -hmm. And then um, I guess through the painting and also through um, other means, I started experimenting with um, color combinations and um, the imagery that we're seeing now is, is uh, my dye area and um, um, so I'm, I'm using, and these are the, all the tea bags that I did use. And uh, so, at, you know, um, color to me can be very um, overwhelming. It can, it can take you from somewhere and take you somewhere else and uh, I think I love the lusciousness of, of the combinations. I was able to, um, in studying color, I was able to combine different colored threads and create my own color that was, uh, uh, that I could then put on top of the colored background. And that's what I started experimenting with, with the, um, with the MRIs that I stopped using an applicant process and started just doing embroidery. And that's pretty much where I've gone now is just embroidery. And so I was using um, five to six threads and creating my own colors um, to try to create a lusciousness or an impact or whatever I, I felt was needed at the time. And um, then as I started, um, I think, developing, I started going away from the, the color and started using um, color for subtlety. Because sometimes color can take on a whole narration of its own. And I didn't want it to, to um, take the message away from the image itself. I wanted the image to be the important aspect. And I can do that. Um, yes. I mean, I, I have watched your um, work over the years and you're right. Um, it has gone from some pretty intense use of color, very saturated, very brilliant colors um, to now there's very little color. It's more tonality, um, gradations of very, low saturation grays but um all through this i mean you can see from the the powerpoint images this is a, a rigorous process that you go through in order to control the color um there's even the uh the famed uh color bible that you have uh tell yes. us a little bit about that i think we saw some bits of that um i was taking uh, some color classes from a wonderful colorist and um, she would, she taught us how to combine colors to create thousands and thousands of colors. And it, you can see in the image now. Um, so her process was to take uh, a primary red, a primary blue, a primary yellow, and um, mix it in various ways and in various uh, degrees. And then from there, she also um, was experimenting um, with um, grays and how you create grays and, and neutrals. And it's very difficult to do in fiber. Um, and <clears throat> it is actually quite difficult with thread because 
there aren't that many different grays and grounds and um, you almost have to create that yourself. I think one thing that um, I found with my more subtle things that I'm working with now is that I always include a strand of gray because gray can create so much luminosity and um, depth. So that always is part of the um, combination of threads. Yeah, I think that's one of the um, things that you and I most connected on uh, when I first met you was because in my painting class, your observations of color were so um, precise and acute. Um, you were able to really see the, um, the subtle shifts when a blue goes, leans more green or leans more toward violet. And um, I think I too, as a painter, am always um, messing around in those gray areas, but always tilting them one way or another. And I think you and I shared a kind of love of that sort of uh, sensitivity to color. And, and yeah. I see that the way you're ribboning your threads together it creates that sort of vibration, very much like the the impressionist painters were were doing mm -hmm. uh, in the 19th century, and getting that sort of optical vibration by putting colors side by side. Right, and that was a lot of that was so so much fun in in trying to create those things that would make your eye do the coloring and um, the combinations that. Um, uh, that you wouldn't normally see uh, put together, but but putting them together works. So as you said, you're you're actually moving into a um, a period of um, very little color in your work or almost no color. Um, you've you've set aside the uh, the MRI series. I don't know permanently or temporarily, but I know that you've been working on this geography series. Did you want to mention that a little bit? Um, or is that a little too new and tender to uh, introduce into the discussion? Oh, no, it's just something that I'm experimenting with. And um, so I've been doing topography using and blowing them up quite large. And we didn't talk too much about scale, but I think scale is uh, crucial in in um, in the work. I think um, it makes a bigger statement. Um, and um, so I was blowing up the maps quite, quite large, about 72 by 92. And um, so I was looking at, at first, our misuse of land and our misuse of um, rivers and um, the impact that it's going to have on on the impact that it has on um, people today and and environments today. Yes. So I I was going that through that um, kind of um, just. A, I'm, you know, still, still experimenting and still not sure. It's kind of on the sidelines a little bit now, but um, I'll get back to it. That's right. You told me that you've actually set that aside and you're working on a COVID-19 series. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Um, I do have a sample of what I'm working on. Um, I'm taking, excuse me for getting too close. <laughs> I'm taking rice paper and um, stitching on it. I've been using paper in, in my work um, since the tea bags. So I first started just, just as a, a challenge to myself if I could sew on paper. And um, so the tea bags was uh, proving pretty difficult, um, but I, I got the process down and realize what I could work with it. And in my gun violence series that we really haven't talked about yet. That's right. Um, I used paper and it was 
a little bit easier to, to, to stitch. And um, now I'm using rice paper and it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to stitch because it wants to tear and you can only sew it, it, you can only sew it once. You can't make a mistake with it. So um, I don't know if this can be seen, but I visualize this as almost like an Asian scroll and it's somewhat um, transparent because it's a, a, a special kind of rice paper that has, they call it a uh, dragon cloud. It has little uh, streams of um, codes of quite beautiful when you're um, seeing it through the light. But um, with the COVID thing, I just felt kind of lost. I didn't, I knew I wanted to show something, but I wasn't sure how I would show um, this terrible impact. And um, so I thought, well, I'm going to um, kind of memorialize those people that lost their lives. And so I'm using um, a spiral kind of as a symbol of life and kind of like a, a, the tree rings showing the life of each person. Mm -hmm. And each and, spiral represents one person who has died of the yeah. coronavirus? Yes. And so this is going to be, um, I visualize it being looped in um, 11 foot loops, kind of in, um, kind of like a, a, an ancient scroll being looped. Yeah. And, um, so we'll Paula, can I interrupt and ask a question? Sure. Um, is the rice paper a continuous loop or are you needing to glue sheets together to get the length for the scroll? Well, I'm buying the, um, the paper in 60 foot rolls. So far, I think I need um, 12 or 13 rolls and I will um, piece them together as one continuous loop. Wow. The, the most chilling part is we don't know when this piece will end because I'm assuming that you will just keep adding um, as, the, as the pandemic continues. Yeah. Um, it's going to take a long time to get caught up because I started quite late, but I think um, I'm at 15,000 right now. And... Hmm. Paula, are you changing, are you using black thread for this, the circles? Or are you, you inter making different colors with the threads? Actually, it's two threads and it's a brown variegated and a dark gray. But I wanted it to have more warmth than black. So I used a, a brownish and it reads as almost black, but not yeah. quite. So. Stunning. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, so you just touched on the fact that we had not mentioned the gun violence series. And that was, I think, one of the latest shows that I saw of yours. Do you want to talk a little bit about the gun violence um, pieces and what, where that came about and what you were trying to say with that? Well, again, it was using MRIs and x-rays. And um, at the time I was working on this, there were a lot of mass shootings going on and I was just pissed off. And so I wanted to make some imagery um, showing what, that these aren't numbers, these are actually people. And so I took the um, mulberry paper and I have, I have kind of an example here, but, um, I tore the mulberry paper into pieces and, and then put, the, put it back together to show, kind of symbolize the, um, the, um, the tragedy 
the um, these cause, and then um, I used quite subtle colors, just blues and grays, mm -hmm. and then um, the background was stitched kind of like on the monitors in the hospital, mm -hmm. and these zigzaggy lifelines. Yeah, and um, so there was a lot of symbolism in each piece. And um, again, I found the imagery online. I didn't luckily know anyone experiencing this, but it was quite tragic to see, see what's on the internet. Um, so you had to, you had to uh, edit a lot and um, pick certain things um, so that it, it wouldn't be so um, awful, actually, is what, the only thing I can say. Wow. But yeah. it, it was done like the MRIs that I, I had previously done. So your choice to paint to uh, paint to uh, stitch on paper, um, just on a purely pragmatic level, it would probably be easier to stitch on cloth. Why the paper? And, and I mean, I love it. And I love the way you're exploring all these different kinds of paper. Um, why and, and what do you think it, it adds to the work? Well, at first it was a challenge. And um, a lot of fiber artists are using paper now. And it was just a challenge to see if I could do it. Using the tea bags, I just, I, I loved the way each tea bag had its own impression it had no tea bags were the same mm -hmm. and um so i loved that individuality that i could then put together to create um a background and um i think a lot of using paper is the just this concept too of transparency I, I would like to have some kind of a feel of transparency or uh, fleeting, that this is a fleeting moment. I think with the tea bags, um, I wanted to show that um, that life is precious. Yes. So fragile. So ephemeral. Um, and the way that they're installed the air currents, at least when you had your solo exhibition at the Halden Gallery at um, Lake Tahoe Community College, the tea bag um, fabric or whatever was swaying every time there was air currents in the gallery. And that, um, so that kinetic aspect of the work was, um, it felt like it was a really important part of how we perceived that work as well. Yeah, I, I love that lightness yeah that you get i was using raw silk before and it's just so heavy and um it didn't have any movement i think it is important yeah yeah um so what artistic plans do you have for the future paula can you tell <laughs> us like what lies ahead for you uh, i don't know i guess it's when i get pissed off and get in something else <laughs> <laughs> I may explore something else. I don't know. Uh, you just never know, but you have to be open to it. Well, certainly in the last week or so, we've been so aware of the Black Lives Matters uh, movement and the tragedy of um, what happened in Minneapolis. Um, are there any bubblings um, inside you, uh, a response to that? Um, I think it, it takes a long time to bubble up, so I'm sure it's percolating. Yeah. So, see, you know, it, it does take a long time. It's, it's, it, it's hard to, um, to make an image to visualize something, how you would uh, symbolize that subtly. Right, I think um, your work 
isn't a knee-jerk reaction so much as a deeper and a little bit more um, sophisticated and uh, what subtle and far-reaching kind of symbolism that you're that you're going for what I feel in your work anyway um, so I think we all look forward to whatever it is that comes across your uh, um, <laughs> needle <laughs> your, yeah. your needle how about that good one. yeah good one. yeah yeah um so so i would i just have one other thing i want to talk about when you were doing the flower series i'm sure they were very very popular with a broad broader audience um i think you had more sales when you were doing your flower series and i would imagine that there's probably been a little bit less sales with the mri um body series that kind of thing how do you feel about the commercial aspects of the art world as relates to your own process? Well, I think now, and it really never has been important to me, and just creating the art was the most important. Um, it wasn't about creating something that would be sellable. It was, um, I wanted to create beauty and sometimes beauty that wasn't easy to see or and um none of that stuff is sellable it really um no well, one I wants have, a broken arm in their living room i have to say that the um the brain aneurysm piece pieces that hung in the halden gallery were just just exquisitely beautiful and yet um there is something very sad and very disturbing about the idea of someone sustaining brain damage so that we can all watch uh sunday afternoon football games um so i i feel like you dance around a lot of these things a kind of an exquisite um sad sort of beauty i guess does that sound yeah, uh, th that's kind of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sharon, have we missed anything that you think our audience would like to know from Paula? Um, there's only one tiny thing uh, that I wanted to mention uh, to the viewers, that when Paula mentions using five or six threads, Paula, if I've got this right, you put five or six threads through the same needle on your sewing machine that that's how you mix the colors they go in through the same stitch. yes uh, i'm using um just a commercial machine that goes up and down and it has one needle and, and note for sewers that are listening there's no presser foot on the machine there's right there's no presser foot and um you you move um like if i were trying to draw with with my machine needle i have to move the paper or i have to move the fabric in order to um to create that um image mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. so what's being shown right now is a process that i uh that i was using for the mris that i would map out the various values of uh an MRI from the x-ray or uh, from from the x-ray film or the image that was in black and white and, and in this image I'm um, changing the values into col different colors rather than just doing values and um, so I have the area mapped out on a dissolvable dissolvable film that I attach to the base. And um, that gives me the um, boundaries of where those, where that value or where that color would be. Just gorgeous, really gorgeous. So are there any more questions that, or comments? That, Im that image was Phyllis's sister-in-law. <laughs> Oh, it was all right. <laughs> well, 
I, I thank you so much to Phyllis and Paula. This was an amazing interview and I learned a lot and I'm thrilled that it is uh, going to live online. Um, so thank you. The, just as a note for the viewers, Paula's impact exhibition is open to the public in the Carson City Courthouse. Uh, it's going to be up through June 26th. We extended the show because it was, everything got shut down. Um, but the courthouse is open Monday through Friday from eight to five. The gallery is up on the second floor. During this time of pandemic caution, our, uh, all of our exhibitions are available via virtual tours. Go to our website, ccaind.org. Click on one of the scrolling exhibitions that's on the homepage and you'll see a blue tour link on each of the shows and that will take you to the tour link. In conjunction with Paula's show, Chris Lanier wrote, in, we commissioned an essay by Chris Lanier. Um, it's as equally powerful as Phyllis's interview and that's available on the website listed under essays. It's also linked on from Paula's impact post. The initiative- It's provides, also on my website. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, the initiative provides honorary to its participating artists and speakers, and we invite viewers to help support this effort with annual memberships or donations. Uh, please go to ccaind.org and click on support. I want to sincerely thank uh, Nevada Humanities for its support of Nevada Neighbors and to Phyllis and Paula for their time and wonderful questions. And thank you for viewing this presentation. We'll see you soon.